Welcome to The Gold Exchange with Keith Wiener, where we untangle market and policy complexity using timeless economic principles. For show notes and archives, go to goldexchangepodcast.com. And now, on to today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome again to The Gold Exchange Podcast. I'm John Flaherty, and I'm here with Keith Wiener, founder and CEO of Monetary Metals, I'm excited for today's topic, Keith, the dismal science of economics. To lead into this, I want to relay a joke that I heard in grad school, and I I actually Googled it and found that it kind of dates back to the 70s, at least according to Wikipedia. And it goes something like this. Physicist, a chemist, and an economist are all stranded on a desert island with only a, a can of beans, closed can of beans between the three of them. As the story goes, the chemist and the physicist immediately set about to scientifically devise a way to open this can. And the economist simply says, assume a can opener. And uh, I've never forgotten that. And I think that might be a good segue to, to our topic today. Economics is often called the dismal science. It doesn't seem to have the same respect as the other fields of quote unquote, real scientific study. What's your take on that, Keith? You know, my first thought is just thinking about that as well. That's classic. Just assume whatever it is that's convenient to assume in order to make everything else work. And then I was thinking, you know, it kind of reminds me of the field of what would have been sort of physics before Galileo really did his work. And the, the medievals believed that if you throw a rock, that the rock would fly straight until it ran out of force, and then basically it would turn a corner and, and fall straight down. You know, I wasn't there at the time, but I can only imagine that people didn't have a lot of respect for anybody that was talking about that kind of stuff. Of course, anybody that went out into the real world could throw a rock or ask some kid to throw a rock while they stood off to the side somewhere and watch the flight of the ark. The flight of the rock, excuse me, I just gave away the punchline watch the flight of the rock, and they could see that it travels in an arc. There's no abrupt running out of force and and going down. In some ways, I think the field of economics is kind of like that even today, where the medieval notion of physics was before uh, Galileo. So, you know, when I looked at this topic, the first thing that came to mind was, like other fields of science, uh, especially technical ones, you have this whole vocabulary of technical jargon, right? Words like quantitative easing and forward guidance and the Taylor rule. And so as as you listen to economists sort of spout these different technical terms, you know, it's easy as a layman to kind of have your eyes gloss over and say, well, I'm sure glad these guys know, you know, what they're talking about. But then here in the real world, we have this boom bust cycle that continues to get worse and worse. And and yet when these people are, are brought before Congress or, or TV cameras, they, they don't really have, they can't really explain away, you know, how they were wrong. And so what, what are your thoughts on, on that? Is that contributing to this, this label of the dismal science? <laughs> so much of that is political hacking rather than, you know, much of a pretense at economics. And I was going to say, when you said uh, jargon and then you say quantitative easing, I first thought, is that ain't jargon? That's a euphemism or a political, you know, slogan in a way. It's designed to obscure what it is that they're doing. And basically they are increasing the quantity of, of what they want us to believe is money. And, um, you know, they do that because they believe, uh, you know, it's kind of getting back to that medieval analogy. They kind of believe that, you know, if it's Midsummer's Eve and you cut some fresh mistletoe and you have Eye of Newt and, and you say the magic incantations and you increase the quantity of frog's blood in the stew then you know whatever he's going to fall in love with the girl or or whatever it is that that potion is supposed to do they believe that they're making the economy stronger by by doing this but they don't really want to quite quite openly admit what they're doing and so um so they use all these terms to obfuscate it right to make it unclear uh so that you know people's eyes are supposed to glaze over uh both these euphemisms and of course then when they get technical and they start talking about the fed's balance sheet and the distinction between m0 versus m2 money supply and um you know are conditions truly easing or not and the pci deflator and you know and on and on and on with all this stuff and everyone thinks that it's just an argument of statistics and of course, if it's an argument of statistics, then it's really impossible to make any kind of 
certainly moral evaluation, but even really tie it to anything uh, that, that touches on causality. And um, uh, I just want to say something about causality, because I think ultimately, if you are trying to do science, you have to be thinking about the identity of the objects you're studying, right? Every every entity that you put, whether it's under a microscope or you put it into an uh, explosion chamber or whether you're throwing it out of a cannon at high velocity or whatever it is, every everything that exists has an identity. It is what it is and it isn't what it isn't. And there are actions that are occurring. Those actions occur because of causality. So, uh, you know, famously, if you're studying physics and you have a whole chamber full of a gas, you know, there's there are equations that describe the behavior of an ideal gas, PV equals NRT, which, you know, relates pressure and temperature and so forth and tells you what's going to happen if you compress it to half its volume or let some gas out or whatever. It can explain all that. That's what a science should be doing. And all too often, economics, or what's claimed to be economics, isn't doing that at all. So is this a recent phenomenon, Keith? I wonder if you could maybe rewind in history a little bit. Is it the case that the study of economics used to be more of a pure science and has just been infected with, you know, the ideas of, say, Keynes or, or, or some other prominent figure that sort of changed the game and kind of led, led the field astray? Can you give us some historical context on the science? Well, first of all, it kind of makes me mindful of the joke, nostalgia isn't what it used to be. But, um, you know, this belief that everything was, was once really grand and golden and today everything's turned to rubbish. But I can certainly think of an example, kind of a humorous one. Um, I think it was late in the 19th century when, you know, somebody was projecting the increase in the number of horses in New York City, or maybe it was London, and just looking at, well, in 1800 we had this many, in 1850 this many. And they're projecting, you know, by 1920, there's going to be so many horses that, you know, the entire city will literally be meters deep in, you know, horse poop. And, um, you know, what, what they're doing there is they're like taking a, uh, a ruler, a straight edge, and they're, they're taking a graph of the number of horses that are in the city. And, of course, each horse produces a certain volume of poop. So you can multiply horses times some constant and you get how much poop is being generated. And then you say, well, how, how wide is each street and how, how many miles of streets are there and so forth. And then you just do the math and then you project forward and say, well, if the rate, if horses are doubling every 20 years or whatever it is, by this time, you know, we're going to have two meters deep of standing poop and we'll never be able to shovel it fast enough. You know, as I recall from what I read of this incident, you know, all of the intelligentsia uh, or the literati were, you know, um, wringing their hands and crying their crocodile tears over this. And meanwhile, of course, it didn't happen. And um, if there's a lesson for economists in all this is that you, nothing continues on a trend like that forever, especially if there's aspects of it that are clearly unsustainable. What happens is, you know, some clever entrepreneur comes along and completely changes the rules of the game. And that's the thing that defies both the economists and all too many economists or what I would call court economists. That is that their express role or their purpose in life is to either attempt to cook up a central plan to be imposed by the state or to post hoc justify whatever central plan is imposed by the state and then sell it, you know, in, in the way of propaganda. And so, of course, the state central planners never want or reckon with the crazy entrepreneur that says, you know, let's invent an automobile. It's going to be a horseless carriage, which is what it was called at the time initially. And, uh, of course, that completely takes us off the, the trajectory of burying the city in poop. So now today, of course, what do they do is they have their straight line projections of smog due to the automobile. You know, the cycle repeats over and over again. And, of course, there's the old saying that people who don't study history are doomed to repeat it. And there's, there's an example of it right there. So you had mentioned in um, an earlier episode about the the 2008 crisis, and, and you had a front row seat to that uh, with the sale of your business and, and then what led to, um, you know, starting this new uh, venture. But uh, I wonder if you could comment on how they didn't see 2008 coming. I mean, I've seen timelines in 2007 where Bernanke is, is saying, yeah, everything's good. You know, housing might be a little frothy, but nothing to see here. And then, you know, two months later, it, it's just sort of an iterated version of that, but really no concern. And then, you know, kaboom. And, you know, they, they, they have their explanations for, you know, why their models didn't work. But is there is there any comments you have about as the most recent kind of dramatic example of, you know, we've got these very smart people uh, at the Fed uh, who are supposed to be in charge of smoothing these things out and preventing these things. Any comments on the science of economics and, and how it left us, you know, wildly unprepared for the 2008 boom and bust? 
Yeah, you know, one practical technical answer, hopefully not that technical, and one a little more theoretical. The the practical technical answer is that they can't spot a bubble because so if you define a bubble as asset prices are higher than they should be, then okay, that begs the question of what do you mean by should? If you if you want to try to calculate what what an asset is worth, you have to look at its the cash flows it's going to generate in the future. So let's say I have a piece of property, I rent it out for a thousand dollars a year, and so you have a uh, a cash flow that says a thousand plus. Now let's 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 leave out an, an so-called inflation for the moment. You have a thousand this year, and a thousand next year, and a thousand the year after, out into perpetuity. So the property will generate rent essentially forever, which isn't necessarily true, but let's just go with that assumption. Let's assume a can opener. Let's let's assume there's no inflation, and let's assume that the the rent is out in perpetuity. Then you have you have a, you have an infinite series. It's a thousand plus a thousand plus a thousand. Now it's not worth infinite money today because each future year has to be discounted because there's a time value of money. Being that we're mortal human beings, we value something uh, you know that we have today versus a promise to pay it in a year. Apart from the risk of whether you'll get it in a year, there's still the utility of having it in your hand versus having to wait a year to get it. So um, uh, the value next year is less than the value this year. And so it turns out that the best factor to use for discounting those future payments is the interest rate. So if the interest rate is 10%, for example, then you have 1,000 plus 900 plus 810 plus 720 dot, dot, dot. And um, a straightforward application of mathematics to say, well, then that infinite series has a finite sum and that finite sum is $10,000. 1,000 plus 900 plus 810 plus 720 dot, dot, dot. That adds up to 10,000. So, uh, okay. So then that what that's saying is that the value of this asset today is $10,000, uh, assuming that the interest rate is... Ten uh, percent, assuming that the, the 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 future payments are certain, and that you're not you know you're not taking credit risk or other kinds of market risks like that, um, it's worth ten thousand dollars. So the problem is, what happens if you are the central bank, and these are the very same people that were asking why didn't they see it, and you're the central bank, and you think, well, we've got to lower the interest rate because we have to stimulate GDP because you know unemployment is dropping and, and, uh, and so forth, and we don't have inflation. So according to all their formulas, um, they say that they're supposed to lower the interest rate. So you lower the interest rate, and you miss the fact that um, at a lower interest rate, now you have to recalculate the discounted value of all those future payments. And so at 5%, it's no longer 900 plus 810 plus 720, et cetera. It's now 950 plus a little over 900 plus a little over 850 and so forth. And that is an infinite series that adds up to $20,000. So by cutting the interest rate in half, you've doubled the net present value. And so then the asset price doubles. So anybody who's doing the math, it says, okay, is the asset price, is the asset overpriced? They would look at the interest rate and they would do this discount calculation and they'd say it isn't. Even though everybody is wondering, wait a minute, the price of all the real estate in the country doubled. How could that be? Isn't that a bubble? Anybody doing the net present value calculation would say, no, it's not a bubble. It's fine. Missing the fact that the interest rate is the all important variable. I think modern economics does not pay as much attention, nearly as much attention to the interest rate and the fact that the interest rate is falling and the consequences of the falling interest rate as it should. And so that's kind of my practical explanation. They can't really see the bubble because from within the interest rate that they administer, it isn't really technically a bubble. I mean, let's assuming that, you know, the asset price doesn't get beyond that, um, which I, I don't think it did, you know, leading up to 2008. So that's the, that's the practical reason. The theoretical reason why they don't see it, well, I guess then I suppose there's a really simple political retort, and that is these are the court economists whose job it is partly to help design the central plan and proper, pro partly to act as propagandists to sell the central plan to the people. They're the last people in the world who want to say, you know, we, the government, just screwed up, or we planned it, we're about to screw up. Our plan includes a fatal flaw in it, but we're going to do it anyway. Of course, they're not going to say that. And so then they're departing the realm of economics entirely and, and entering the realm of, of political hack or, or, or partisan shill. But anyways, the theoretical reason is that, as Mises explained so thoroughly, you know, a century ago, um, when he predicted the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1922, um, he predicted it on grounds that the central planner doesn't have and cannot have 
cannot ever have. It's a theoretical, it's impossible to have enough information to perform economic calculation. So when you administer a price, and the interest rate is the most important price in the economic world, when you administer the price of something, you don't really know whether that's the right price. In fact, you are deliberately self-imposed, blinded to whatever the right price might be. Even if there was a right price for you to administer, there would be no way for you to know it. And the very fact of administering a price would blot out or stamp out any information that would give you, you know, a clue as to what the right price might be and how far off from that theoretical right price your administered price really is. So you don't know what the right price is. You cannot know what the right price is. You're preventing yourself from ever knowing what the right price is. And you're saying the right price of interest is today, you know, near zero interest rates as it was, uh, you know, from 2009, uh, you know, for many years until they played it at, at hiking rates. So, um, they can't see uh, the bubble and they can't see the consequences of it because they don't know how they don't know if they're off and if they're off they don't know how far off and so that of course blinds them to okay well what would the consequences be if your interest rate was off what would that do well that's not a question that ideologically they're even inclined to uh to attempt to explore because that would lead to all sorts of other uncomfortable truths that they would just assume not uh not admit to so back to our to our joke about assuming the can opener, because they start with this set of assumptions, namely that they can control the economy by dialing the interest rate lever when they want things to go up or cool down. They just simply turn a little dial and and their outcomes, as they claim, you know, they can they can sort of predict and manipulate benevolently, right? But sounds to me like there's nothing really scientific about that if your underlying assumptions lead you to these perverse outcomes again and again. But I want to get to, as we close up here, you contend... If I could just interject for one moment, sure. I was going to say it's dishonest on so many levels, one of which is their stated uh, premise that, you know, if things are not hot enough, they can, um, you know, print more money and increase the money supply. And if things get too hot, then they will, you know, decrease the money supply. Uh, if you take a look at a graph, so on their own stated premises, which are all wrong anyway, but even by their own stated terms on their own stated ground, there's never any unprinting of money. They never actually decrease the quantity of the thing that they call money. And so if you're honest, you'd have to admit certain things. You'd have to admit to yourself, okay, this isn't even... This isn't even right, even on the terms I've stated it to be. And then you'd realize, well, look, I'm just a partisan hack. I'm not an economist at all. <laughs> and then where would that lead? You know, it's like the, the uh, what Star Wars movie was that when um, Obi-Wan Kenobi? Uh, no, it was, oh, no, I'm sorry. It was uh, Keegan John. And um, was it episode one or episode two? He's taking um, a young Anakin Skywalker into some sort of bar or something like that. And this punk is like, hey, you want to buy some death sticks? And then he does the little Jedi, you know, hand wave mind trick thing and says, no, no, you don't want to sell me death tricks. You want to go home and rethink your whole life. And then the guy looks confused and he's like, yeah, yeah, I don't want to sell you death sticks. I want to go home and rethink my whole life. And then he scurries off. That's kind of what you'd have to do if you were a court economist. And then you somehow were forced to confront the fact that even on your own stated terms, none of this works the way that you claim that it does, let alone that your stated terms are all bogus. You'd kind of have to scurry off like that punk with the death sticks and rethink your whole life. So, of course, very few people actually want to do that, which is why that made such a memorable scene in a movie, because nobody actually does that unless a Jedi apparently waves his hand at him. So anyways, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just thought thought that would be... No, they, they, they're certainly viewed as, as Jedis. I mean, they're... I think your analogy of the court economist is, is appropriate in that they are operating at the highest levels of government and academia and finance. And so they're these credentialed people, they, they have immense power, which ends up impacting the lives of everyday folks. And yet when things go horribly wrong, there's always some explanation other than the central plan <laughs> was, was wrong. But again, I want to redirect Keith to we're talking about this dismal science, right? And all the pitfalls and the and the bad assumptions that lead to the perverse outcomes. But you you actually contend with your with your study of economics in the new Austrian school that you can actually bring the precision of real scientific thinking to monetary economics. How do we how do we get from A to B, Keith? Well, you have to you have to start at the beginning. You know, which which is tough and it's very daunting. Um, especially when you come to a field, and I take a lot of flack for saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway, that 
when it comes to monetary economics, right? So economics outside of money, there's a lot of really well understood things. There's a lot of economists who can explain to you why imposing tariffs is going to impoverish uh, you know, a nation. Um, why trying to set, um, you know, wage floors or price caps or all these things. You know, Adam Smith wrote a lot of this wisdom in 1776, the year of the American Revolution, right? This is very well old, very, very well understood old stuff. You know, if you have regulations on food trucks, you know, you'll get fewer food trucks and they'll be of higher price. And if you, you know, set all these preconditions for medical research, you'll get less medical research. It'll take longer and longer to find cures for things like cancer. This is very well understood. But monetary economics as a, as a science is, is kind of like physics before Galileo and before Copernicus. It's, it's at the point where, you know, the medievals used to believe that everything went around the earth. The sun revolved around the earth, all the other planets revolved around the earth. And they were staring at a problem that was called retrograde motion. When you look through a telescope at the other planets and you're assuming that these other things revolving around the earth, it's inexplicable why these planets would seem to go forward in their orbit for a while and then reverse and go backwards for a bit, kind of do a loop-de-loop -loop and then continue on in their orbit and then do it again. There's no explanation for what would make a planet reverse in its orbit and, and do a loop like that. You know, as we know today, of course, the whole thing was based on, was an artifact of, of their assumption that things were going around the earth, which they had other reasons, theological reasons to believe that's, you know, believe that the geocentric view of, of Ptolemy. And, um, you know, monetary economics today is a lot like that. There are reasons why people want to believe what they believe. It's the want to believe, the wanting to believe something that is not science. So when you said, you know, the precision of science, I would uh, substitute or at least add another word to that, which is discipline. It's a discipline of thought, a discipline of mind and how you approach things. Anytime you find yourself wanting a certain conclusion, just you know, use that as your own internal like red flag or reset button and say, wait a minute, shake your head and you know, go take a sip of water or just go take a walk around the block and come back and say, wait, that's not science, that's not valid. I can't want to have a conclusion and then try to post hoc justify or rationalize that conclusion. You're just going about it wrong. So you, you have to start and say, what, what am I actually observing? and then start to think from there about what are the natures of the entities? What is the identity of this object that I'm staring at? What makes it so? And then what is the causality? How does this act on this? So um, for a great example of that, I think Karl Menger, the, uh, the founder uh, of the Austrian School of Economics, has a very Aristotelian approach. And I think Aristotle should really be credited as the father of logic and ultimately Without logic, there's no such thing as science. In, in his approach and saying, okay, suppose, suppose a man who's a farmer of wheat uh, brings some wheat to the market to trade. And he, you know, he's looking at this idea of, is there such a thing as a right price of wheat? But you know, he says, okay, so suppose this guy who brings the wheat to the market encounters another guy who also has wheat. Will there be an exchange? Will the one guy trade his wheat for the other guy's wheat? And if there was a right price, and they both had the right price, then in theory, there'd be no reason not to. But Menger is very clear that obviously there won't be. Because of course, there's two prices, bid and offer. You know, each one wants to offer a price, but when he sees, you know, anyways, without getting into all the details of that. So he begins to observe the nature of the entity, which is, uh, you know, as we now call it, acting man, uh, from Mises, acting man, or economizing, what was his term? The economizing man, something like that. The economizing um, actor, economizing individual, has some goals in mind because, of course, he's a human being. Human beings have a certain need for food. Within food, it's a variety. We don't want to just eat bread. We want to also eat meat. And so this guy who's bringing wheat to market is keenly interested in finding somebody who brought meat to market. Then there's going to be a trade. And so he begins to observe uh, later, you know, causality uh, um, based on the identity of this actor, this economizing individual, he can observe the causality, the laws by which he operates. And one of the first laws is the marginal utility of each good is always diminishing. In other words, the value that you put on, if you have 
100 units of wheat and you're the farmer of wheat, so of course you have basically, you're overflowing in the stuff. You have 100 units of wheat. The value that you put on the 101st unit is very low. It could be basically zero. You don't value it. And so your desire to acquire any more wheat is either zero or even negative. But to anyone else who doesn't have any wheat, the value they put on the first unit of wheat is much, much higher. And so, um, you know, he, he goes through whole discussions of this stuff, but the point being that you're, you're beginning to do a science because instead of just extrapolating a trend like horses in the city of, of New York and therefore horse poop piling up in the streets, or instead of just trying to justify government policy and central planning and, and just selling the propaganda of it, you're saying, okay, what is the nature of this person? What is the nature of value, how people value goods? And coming up with this law that says the utility of a good at the margin is 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 diminishing, and then you can go into what is the marginal use of wheat and so forth. And there's you know for anybody who's interested in this stuff, I highly recommend Principles of Economics by by Menger. Uh, but the point being, that's how you begin a scientific approach as compared to a, a guy with a straight edge approach, or as compared as compared to a propagandist for the regime approach. So Keith, is there any way? or any path that you see for the current schools of economics as taught in Western democracies to start to open their mind to, to these principles, or is there too much, too many incentives that are going to keep us here? And what, if anything, is going to turn the tide to get economics back into a science that can be more uh, respected and adhering to the principles that you started to outline here? That's a fascinating question. My first knee-jerk reaction to that is to say that there's an old saying that science advances one funeral at a time. And by that, what is meant is that usually the old practitioner is in his 60s or 70s, has a great deal of prestige, professor emeritus, Nobel Prize, high government position, position at an investment bank where he's making hundreds of millions of dollars a year, all those things. That person has not only no incentive to learn a new way, as Upton Sinclair uh, pointed out, um, it's impossible to, I forget the exact quote, but something like it's impossible to teach a man something that his salary depends on him not knowing. So you, you're never going to, I'll, I'll just pick on Paul Krugman for, for obvious reasons, hopefully obvious reasons, you know, Nobel Prize, all this stuff, very prestigious position. You know, he's got a basically blank check at, at the New York Times to write, you know, whatever it is he chooses to expectorate onto a piece of paper and they'll print it. Somebody in his position just is not interested in a new idea. But the Young Turks who haven't committed to that yet, haven't made their name based on that yet, haven't had the success yet, um, may be receptive to something better. And then in that case, you really have to make sure that the argument you're presenting them is better. If it just comes across as partisan bickering from the other side of the aisle, I witnessed a debate between Stephen Moore, who was on the Wall Street Journal editorial board. I'm not sure if he was the head of that board or not. And uh, an economist who writes for the Wall Street Journal, he's on TV a lot, obviously the more conservative side of things, debated Paul Krugman at Freedom Fest in Las Vegas some years ago. You know, all of Stephen Moore's arguments were arguments for why red states are better than blue states, why, well, at the time Obama was president, so why Bush was a better president than Obama. And if that's all you're doing, then it's clear that you've, you know, jumped down into the same mud wrestling pit as the other guy. So Krugman's clearly a partisan hack. Uh, for the Democrats, if you just jump down, tear off your tuxedo jacket, rip off your bow tie, and you get into the mud and start grappling with him, kicking mud in his face, you really know better. And um, you're going to persuade exactly nobody that, uh, you know, your position is right. And of course, his position wasn't right. He was trying to equate Bush with uh, free markets and capitalism, which, you know, you can't square that circle. So you have to make sure that you are uh, making a clear argument about an idea and not a partisan uh, in favor just of the other side. And if you make a clear idea and you make your argument compelling, and so just to take just to back to Menger's premise for a minute, and you say that if two wheat farmers both brought wheat to the market, when they see each other, they will not do a trade of one wheat for the other. That's inarguable. Whatever else one might argue about, one is not going to argue that those two guys are going to take their wheat out and trade and then go through the motions of trading coins and giving change. And they both have the same wheat at the end and the same amount of coins in their purse at the end. That's inarguable. 
And if you go on and build an economic science, premise by premise, argument by argument like that, you should uh, you, you should create an unassailable position. And then anybody, right? So, so Ayn Rand said that as long as there's a free market for ideas, this does not apply if you're in the Soviet Union and it's illegal to say certain things or else they arrest you at night and disappear you to a gulag where they torture you to death. If that's the case, then all bets are off. But as long as you have a free market for ideas, then ultimately the true ideas are going to win in the end, not necessarily instantly, because they have the advantage of corresponding with reality and and the opposing ideas are untrue and therefore contradict reality. So uh, it's a very daunting task because you're trying to you're trying to come to, as I started to say earlier, the field of economics, and I get flack for saying this, that there's particularly monetary economics, there's some gems there in what economists have said before, but they're, they're like diamonds in the rough buried in a whole heap of, of dung. And you have to come and kind of build that field uh, up from almost from zero. So it's very daunting. It's very intimidating. You're not, you know, in a certain sense, you're not really welcome in any school. I consider myself to be much closer to the Austrians I consider myself to be of the Austrian school, certainly not the monetarists or the Keynesians. But you have to, you have to carefully and methodically build that. And if you do that, then in the end, the young minds that have not yet been corrupted by you know getting access to real power and real prestige will be sold if you make a rigorous argument and and you're honest in, in promoting it. You don't try to sell it. You don't try to browbeat people. You don't try to pressure them to join your tribe and all those other things that we see going on in partisan politics, then then I think it's just possible. Well, great. Keith, this has been a great discussion. Appreciate your insights today. Thank you for joining us on The Gold Exchange. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Go to goldexchangepodcast.com to learn how you can earn a yield on gold paid in gold.